Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Godot Game Lab. In this video, we'll create the unit spawner component, which allows us to spawn units inside the game at runtime programmatically. So you can see that we have some testing code here. We created a new unit stats resource for Robin. And what we do is we spawn 15 Robins with half a second intervals. So we spawn one, then wait half a second, we spawn one, wait half a second, and so on. So if we run the game, we have a couple of units, but as you can see, the available slots start filling up in these half second intervals. Pretty cool. So all the new units can still use the drag and drop system and the unit mover system we created earlier. So units can be dragged around, swapped and so on. Awesome. So let's talk about architecture first. In this video, we'll focus on the unit spawner component. This unit spawner component is, you guessed it, used for spawning a unit to the game. So the way it works is it spawns a unit at the first available slot. And if you think about all the auto battlers that are out there, the way it works usually is that it prefers the bench first, if there is an available slot at the bench, but if there isn't, then it will spawn the unit to the game area. If there are no available spots at either of those, then we have some sort of an error message that we cannot spawn a unit because all the available slots are occupied. What we also want to do is to emit a signal after spawning a unit so all the other components in the game can be notified if they need to do something when a unit spawns. In order for this component to work, we need to have access to our two play areas, namely the bench and the game area. Why? Well, because we need to query them to see if they are full or not, so we can decide where to spawn the new unit and also get the coordinates for the first available tile. Without further ado, let's get started. So I have my project open here and just to provide some variety with the units, let's first of all create a third unit stat resource. So in our file system doc, let's go to data units with the units folder selected, right click, create a new resource and search for unit stats.gd. And we can name this something like robin.tres. And if we double click, to open this up in the editor or in the inspector rather, we can fill out all the details. So the name will be for this unit is Robin. The rarity and the gold cost can remain the same. And for the skin coordinates, as you can see here, we need to use two for the X and zero for the Y. Awesome. So we can test if this works or not. If we select unit two, for example, from our scene tree with the arena scene open, and we can just drag and drop robin.tres and since this is a tool script, the skin should be updated instantly and it does work properly. Awesome. So now we can move on to actually spawning the new units. And the first step will be to create this new component before adding it to the scene tree inside the arena. So again, in our file system doc, let's expand the components folder, right click on it, create a new script and we can call this unit underscore spawner .gd, and we can turn off the templates so we have no auto generated code. Click on create and double click on unit spawner .gd to open it up inside the script editor. And the script itself will be pretty simple because the sole or only responsibility of this class is to spawn new units. So the first thing we'll do is we'll provide a custom class name called unit spawner. Then we'll define our signal called unit spawned. Again, this will be emitted after we have successfully spawned a new unit. And in case any other system needs the unit itself, we pass it as a parameter. Then we'll have a constant defined called unit and we'll just preload our unit scene, which we already have. And then we need to export variable for the two dependencies of this component. So in order for unit spawning to work, as we talked about in the architecture, we need our two play areas, the bench and the game area. Then we'll have a private method called get first available area, which returns a play area. This is where we have our logic to get the first available area. And again, we will prefer the bench if there is an available slot. 
So we just write an if statement and say that if the unit grid is not full in the bench, then we can return the bench as the play area, which is available. Else, if the game area is not full, then we don't have an available slot at the bench, but we do have one at the game area. So then we return the game area. And if both of those are full, then we return null because there is no valid play area where a unit can be spawned. And sort of the main part of this component is the spawn unit public method, which will use this get first available area we just implemented. So we do have one parameter for this method and it will be unit stats resource. So we'll spawn a unit based on the stats of the unit, right? The first thing we do is we grab the first available area. Again, this can be either the bench. If the bench is full, then the game area. If both of those are full, then null. So here we'll provide a temporary solution using an assert statement and we just check if the area is not null. Because if the area is null for now we'll just throw an error message saying that no available space to add the unit to. This won't do it in the final build of the game because we don't really want to have a runtime error if we cannot add a new unit. Instead we just want to provide sort of an in-game pop-up UI message or something like that that your bench and the game area is full so you cannot really buy new units. But since we don't really have a pop-up UI system to do this for now, it's perfectly fine to do an error message. But I just left a to-do comment in here and you can see that in the newer versions of Godot this is really handy because we have some highlighting for special words inside comments. Okay, but if we do have a first available area which is valid, then the first thing we do is we create a new instance of the preloaded unit scene and store it in a variable called new unit. Then the other thing we need to do is to get the first available empty tile coordinate from the unit grid where we want to spawn the unit at. So we call area that unit grid that get first empty tile. If you remember from the previous episodes, this will return a vector to i, a coordinate where we can spawn our new unit. Then we do two things. We add the new instance of the unit scene as a child inside the scene tree to our unit grid node. And then to make sure that it's actually registered inside the dictionary as well, where we store that information about units, we call the unit grids add unit method too. Then after adding the unit to the game, we need to position it correctly and set the stats of the unit as well. So first of all, we set the global position based on that first available coordinate. Again, we offset it by half the size of the arena like we did in the previous episodes to make sure that it looks centered inside the tile coordinate. And then we can just set the stats property of the unit scene to the unit stats we have as a parameter to the spawning method. And when we're done with everything, one final thing we need to do is to emit the unit spawn signal and say that, okay, we're done with adding the new unit and we can pass that new unit instance as a parameter to the signal. Pretty straightforward, right? So we can save this with Control S, then we can go back to 2D view to actually create that component. So when we're back in 2D view, we can select our arena node, the root node in the scene, click on the plus sign or press Control A, and the simple node will do as we don't really need coordinates for this one. We can just double click on the node type, Again, double click on the node to rename it and we can call it unit spawner. Then, as we usually do, we just drag and drop the script over the new node and you'll see that we have two export variables we need to set, one play area for the bench and one for the game area. So we can just click on assign, select our bench for the first one, make sure that you select the right one. So next to bench, you should see the bench play area node and for the game area, we do the same, but for the game area. Awesome. So let's save this with Control S and run the game to see if it works or not, right? Well, if we run the game, we do have our three units, but they were kind of already there, right? When we started the game, because we instantiated those ourselves inside the scene tree. So the next logical step would be to use some testing code inside the unit spawner to see if it works or not, right? So let's go back to the script tab and see if we can add some testing code. If you like my content, please consider checking out my coffee page where you can donate one time or become a member and get early access to all my content and videos. So for the testing code, we can do something like this. 
let's scroll all the way back up and we can add some code inside our ready callback. So first of all, we'll preload our new Robin unit stats resource, which we just created in the beginning. And then we can create a tween and let's say we want to spawn 15 Robins, right? In order to not make this instant, what I did is I created a for loop and said that we should call the spawn unit method and bind Robin as a parameter. So we have Robin's unit stats resource as the unit we want to spawn. And with the tween interval, we can set a pause between those callbacks. So we don't call them almost instantly, but we wait half a second between each unit spawn. Pretty simple, right? So with this piece of code, we should be able to test our unit spawner. And if we run the game, you can see that actually our bench starts to get filled up with robins. Awesome. So we do have 15 robins and they all occupy the first available spaces. You could see the direction in which they started to fill the available space. Pretty cool. But we do have a problem. When I start dragging one of these robins, I don't really have the tile highlighter, you see that, right? I should be able to drop this or when I drop this robin here, it should snap back to its original position, but it doesn't. And for the three basic ones we already had, it kind of works. It works as intended, right? We can still do it with these three, but the newly spawned units seem to be disconnected from our unit mover component. Why is that? Well, let's investigate, right? So if we press Ctrl Alt O and search for unit mover, which we just created last time, you'll see that we have this setup unit function, right? Where we connect the units drag and drop components, drag started, drag canceled and drop signals to the callback methods where we actually handle dragging and dropping and all that stuff. And if you take a look at this piece of code, when the node is ready in the scene tree, we grab all the nodes from the units group from the scene tree and we call this setup unit method on each and every one of them, right? Well, yes, but we only do this once when the game starts, right? The ready callback is only called once when the game starts and the node is ready in the scene tree. See, the problem is we do have this setup unit method, which handles setting up all the logic for us, but we don't really call it in any of the newly spawned units. Hopefully that makes sense. So we somehow need to find a way to actually call this when we spawn a new unit. And here I believe we have a good lesson to learn. So if we go back to the unit spawner, you could say that, okay, cool. So we can grab an export variable reference to the unit mover. And then we can just make this connection after we spawn a unit. And yes, we could do that. So that's one possible solution. We say that we have a new export variable and say that the unit spawner actually needs to have access to unit mover component to make sure that this connection works. And that's kind of a good solution. Can you guess what my problem is with that? See, if we think about the responsibility of this component, right? The unit spawner already does its thing, right? It spawns the unit in the correct place and does it really have to have the responsibility of setting up a connection to a drag and drop system? I think it sounds a bit weird, right? Because it isn't really the responsibility of the spawner. What we do is we say that, okay, I spawned the unit, I did all the things I need to do, and then I emit this signal that a unit has been spawned. Okay, so another option would be to do it the other way around, right? So since we do have a signal that is emitted when a new unit is spawned, I can go to the unit mover and say that, okay, then the unit mover needs to have an export variable and have access to the unit spawner component. And then we can connect the unit spawned signal to our setup unit method, right? Yes, that's the second solution and it also works perfectly fine, but I kind of think it has the same problem as the first proposed solution. So the unit mover itself needs to handle dragging the unit, canceling the dragging movement, dropping the unit and things like that. Do we really have to have the responsibility to set up this connection? I don't really think the unit mover should care at 
all about how a unit is spawned inside the game world, right? The thing with components is that they should be as reusable as they can be. And while we don't really want to use a unit mover anywhere else in the game, it still kind of violates that idea that the unit mover is solely responsible for moving the units. It doesn't really care about spawning the units. So the solution I propose here is one I kind of hinted in an earlier episode, is that we do have our arena node, the root node, right? And you can think about this node as like an orchestrator. So inside the arena node, we can handle all these connections, right? At the highest level possible. So here we can say that we have access to the unit mover and the unit spawner and connect them ourselves. And we can say that it's the game's or the arena's responsibility to connect these components together. Hopefully that makes sense. What we do here is we make sure that the unit mover and the unit spawner components remain as clean as possible. We don't want them to depend on each other because they do really different things. It's true that we have a connection between them, but we can establish that connection at a higher level, at the top level of our game, at the arena node. So how do we do this? Actually, it's pretty simple. So first of all, we need to grab already variable references to both the unit mover and the unit spawner nodes. So what we can do is we can select both of them. So I select the first one, press and hold control, select the other one, drag them over into our code editor and press and hold control by releasing the mouse. And then we have our two already variable references. We can leave an empty line between those two. And then the actual piece of code is super, super simple. Inside our ready callback, we just say that we connect the unit spawner components, unit spawned signal to the unit mover components setup unit method. And that's it. What you need to make sure of when you do things like that is that the method and the signal signatures match. What do I mean by that? If we press and hold control and click on the unit spawned signal, you'll see that we define it as a signal which passes the unit instance as a parameter. And if we move back to the arena script, press and hold control and click on the setup unit method inside the unit mover component, we can see that the setup unit methods signature is the same. It expects a unit instance as a parameter. That's perfect because it means that we can connect this signal to this method because their signatures match. So what this means is that every time a new unit is spawned inside the game, We'll call this setup unit method to make sure that it can use the drag and drop system we created with the unique mover component. So if we save this with control S and run the game again, maybe drag these units around to see if we skip it over and we do. So now each and every one of these robins should work properly and I can actually use the drag and drop system to swap it with units. I couldn't do it with this one, because if you remember, these are not part of the gameplay system by default, but we, if we drag them over to a slot, then we should be able to swap them around. We can swap these as well. We can swap them with each other. And everything works out of the box, both for those units which weren't spawned with the unit spawner, and for those units which were spawned dynamically at runtime, right? Pretty cool. So everything works as intended now and our unit spawner does its job. One final thing we need to do is to go back to the unit spawner script and when we are sure that everything works as intended, we can delete the testing code like we usually do to make sure that we don't have anything left run the game again. So we should no longer get 15 robins, but we can still drag and drop the other ones. Awesome. So that's it for this video. And I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.